Would you like to hear a little bit about how we search for planets? Okay. Well, um, it's it's you know if I gave you the the uh, the, the the homework assignment to create a uh, a plan, a project, uh, a, a, a research program to find planets around other stars. I bet that one of the things you would think of to do this search would be to employ the Hubble Space Telescope. And you might imagine that if you point the Hubble Space Telescope up at the nearest stars like Tau Ceti and Alpha Centauri, that maybe you could see nearby that star a little dot of light that would be the planet, shining by reflection. As that planet orbits the star, you would see it with the Hubble Space Telescope. The planet goes around and around. It turns out that doesn't work. And the reason is, is that planets are so faint, actually a billion times fainter than their host stars, shining only by reflection, that even the Hubble can't see those planets. So the, the mighty Hubble Space Telescope is actually, sadly, useless for finding planets. So we had to devise a, a trick. And the trick we use is this, that when there's a star orbited by a planet, of course, not only does the planet orbit the star, but the planet yanks on the star gravitationally. There's a pull that the planet exerts on the star, pulling the star by Newton's laws of gravity toward the planet. So as the star orbits, sorry, as the planet orbits, the star gets pulled around in a little tiny circular orbit in response to the planet. And this comes from Newton's laws of physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's the star reacting to the planet. It's a little bit like um, a dog owner with a, a poodle on the end of the leash. Uh, even if the, uh, even if the uh, poodle were invisible, you could tell there was a poodle on the end of the leash because the dog owner would get tugged around by that, uh, uh, by that dog as the dog runs around. And in the case of a star and a planet, it's the planet that's yanking on the star, and of course the leash is gravity. So that's how it works, and we can now detect planets, not by seeing the planets themselves, but watching the host star. And so that's what we do. We use the world's largest telescope. It's called the Keck Telescope, located uh, in Hawaii, high atop a uh, hopefully dormant volcano called Mauna Kea. And uh, we go there every month, uh, in fact, I'm gonna, I just came back a week ago, and I'm going to go again in about two and a half weeks to, to Hawaii, and I go to the volcano, and we use this Keck telescope. And all night long, from 6 p.m. through 6 a.m., we work all night, uh, we point the telescope at different stars, about 100 stars per night, spending about 10 minutes on each star. And here's the, here's the trick that we use. Um, you, you can probably gather how we do this. We watch the stars to see if they are wobbling, jiggling around due to the, to the, you know, the planetary poodle on the end of the leash. Um, but the way we watch to see if the stars are wobbling is by using something called the Doppler effect. And you, you probably all know the Doppler effect. You know, it's what you hear when a train goes by, the whistle changes pitch, as the train comes uh, at you, the, the pitch changes. Well, we, of course, use the Doppler effect not in sound, because sound doesn't travel through outer space, but we use the Doppler effect uh, in the light waves from the star. And, of course, as the star wobbles toward you, the light waves that come at you, the crests and the troughs, those light waves get compressed because the star is coming at you. And then as the star wobbles away from you, the light waves get stretched out. And so we see the light waves change their wavelength, the distance between the crests, uh, using something called a, a spectrometer. And a spectrometer is just a fancy word for a prism that takes the starlight from the back end of the telescope. And when the starlight goes through the prism, it spreads out into all of its colors, blue, green, yellow, and red. And we gather that with a digital camera at the back of the telescope. So we actually record not a picture of the star, but a picture of the spectrum of the starlight, all the colors. And we watch those colors come back a month later and see if the colors have shifted to slightly different colors. And then a month after that, they would have shifted maybe to a slightly different set of colors. And that's the Doppler effect.
So if a star is, is wobbling around, we will see the colors shift slightly due to this Doppler effect, and that tells us there's, there's a planet orbiting the star. So that's how we do it. It's actually, um, you know, uh, easy to explain, as you can see, but it's in, in practice we use computers. We have to write computer programs to analyze the spectrum of colors. It's actually a lot of fun to be creative at the computer and write an analysis that can measure the Doppler shift even more precisely than we were able to do last month or last year. And the more precisely we can measure this Doppler shift, the smaller the planet we can detect. And that's sort of our technical challenge that we face every month uh, that we do this project, is to try to measure even tinier wobbles of the star by this Doppler effect so that we can detect the smallest planetary objects uh, that are orbiting the star. The smallest one we've found so far is about seven Earth masses. You might have even read about it in the paper. We just announced it last June. We found a, a planet that's only seven times the mass of the Earth. Um, that might seem kind of large to you, but just for reference, Jupiter, the planet Jupiter in our own solar system, has a mass 300 times that of the Earth. So we're finding planets that are tiny now compared to Jupiter and Saturn in our own solar system, not quite as small yet as the Earth itself. And that's, of course, where we want to be. So it's, it's, it's an exciting, uh, you know, long road that we're on to try to find, eventually, planets that remind us of home. And that's sort of it. That's the goal. So